Most video gamers have an opinion of the Nintendo Wii. But what do you think is the greatest thing since sliced bread or the downfall of Western civilization? You can't deny the impact it's had on the modern gaming culture. And with both Sony and Microsoft having released motion control products in 2010, that's not about to change. So let's take a few minutes, uh, crack open the shiny white plastic, and find out the way the Wii works. Yes. I've already gone over the technology behind the PlayStation Move, so let's compare and contrast. What's the biggest difference between the Move and the Wii? Well, for starters, the Wii actually sells. Oh, come on, Sony fanboys, I'm just kidding. Here, have a cookie. The most obvious similarity between the two are the Wii Remote and the PlayStation Move motion controller. However, since the Move came out four years later, it was able to integrate a few innovations that weren't very cost-effective for the Wii back in 2006. These include an angular rate sensor, basically a gyroscope, a magnetometer, basically a compass, and a lit orb on top that the PlayStation Eye, basically a webcam, uses for visual motion tracking. What the Wii Remote did have at launch, though, was a linear accelerometer. If you recall the demo from my PlayStation Move video, I explained that accelerometers, such as those in smartphones and the Wii Remote, are used to detect changes in acceleration along three axes. For clarity's sake, let's again name each of these axes in relation to the Wii Remote and the phone. X, Y, and Z. Got it? All right, remember that. Now with a handy Android app, I can show the accelerometer reading my phone's movement, both the initial acceleration up to speed and the deceleration to bring it back to a stop. This helps the Wii Remote read linear motions and relates that information to simple game movements. For example, in Wii Sports Tennis, a movement in the positive X direction can be construed as a backhand return for right-handed people, while a movement in the negative X direction can be construed as a forehand return. In addition, it's important to note that the accelerometer measures proper acceleration. That is, acceleration experienced relative to freefall. Back to the phone, you'll notice it's completely zeroed only in freefall and reads an acceleration of 1G in the positive Y direction while it's held still. Depending on how the controller is tilted, the upward force is applied in different axes, and the Wii Remote can read static position relative to gravity. This is used in games such as Mario Kart Wii, where the pull of gravity recorded in the positive Y direction will turn the cart left, and a pull recorded in the negative Y direction will pull it right. That's all well and good, but how does the accelerometer record all this? Well, again, in my previous video I mentioned that these devices are MEMS, Micro Electro Mechanical Systems. How do these microscopic devices measure acceleration? Well, in lieu of word vomit, which I've already tried, the best way to explain is with an OVERSIMPLIFIED SCIENCE DEMO! Please excuse the crudity of this model, I didn't have time to build it to scale or to paint it. Regardless, what you'll see here is a rough representation of a MEMS accelerometer, blown up approximately a bajillion times. But it's only a two-dimensional model in order to make it easier to see. Just use your theater of the mind to see two more rubber bands coming out of the center of mass, and you'll be closer to the Wii Remote's three-dimensional device. In the middle of the accelerometer is a silicon mass. Let's make believe wood is silicon here, which is surrounded by tiny silicon springs, rubber bands, all around. Now, the center of mass and each of the surrounding sides have a certain capacitance. That is, they're able to hold an electric charge. In parallel plate capacitors, the simplest models around, you'll have two electrically conductive surfaces that are separated by an insulator. The capacitance of this design can be calculated with this equation, but don't get too hung up on that. The most important thing to take away from it is the D on the bottom, distance, meaning the more distance between the conductive plates, the less the capacitance. Back to the demo. If this were a real accelerometer, you'd have four different capacitances at play here, corresponding to the distances between each of the surfaces of the center mass and the outer plates. At rest, they're all equal, but know what happens when I suddenly move the whole apparatus. Inertia, the tendency of an object at rest to stay at rest, or an object in motion to stay in motion, keeps the mass in place for a split second while the outer edges move. 
This increases the gap along the side of the model facing forward, decreasing its capacitance, and decreases the gap along the side facing backward, increasing its capacitance. These values are recorded by the accelerometer and then converted into signals read by the Wii. When the motion stops, the same effect happens in reverse, allowing the accelerometer to record that as well. That covers our tennis swing in Wii Sports. To explain steering in Mario Kart, notice what happens when I turn the accelerometer on its side. Gravity pulls down on the center of mass, causing the side facing down to have a higher capacitance than the side facing up. Tilt the model a little bit to the left and right, and those capacitances also get into the act. It's in this way that the accelerometer can not only detect changes in motion, but gravity as well. That's all well and good, but what about one-to-one -one movement? Accelerometers are great for determining linear acceleration, but are balls at distinguishing between smaller and larger degrees of motion, which is something you'll need if you want Link's sword to accurately follow your every move. This caused detractors to coin the term Wii Waggle, since it only took an indiscriminate flick of the wrist to perform most motion-activated events. Enter the Wii Motion Plus. By 2009, three years after the Wii's introduction, MEMS gyroscopes were cheap enough that Nintendo could implement them in an add-on peripheral to the Wii Remote. Packaging it with a sequel to Wii Sports and selling it for 50 bucks didn't hurt Nintendo's bank account either. Gyroscopes are used to record angular movements. These components are known as pitch, yaw, and roll. In the case of the Wii Motion Plus, it uses a tuning fork gyroscope. Well, actually two, a dual-axis gyro and a z-axis gyro, wherein two test masses vibrate and keep their orientation due to conservation of angular momentum. This means that the gyroscope tends to keep vibrating in its initial plane of orientation regardless of where its support structure moves. This is the same principle at work for larger spinning gyroscopes you might remember as a kid. By again measuring capacitance, a signal that quantifies the rate of rotation is produced and sent to the Wii. By combining the linear readings from the accelerometer and the angular readings from the gyroscopes, the Wii could now record most any degree of motion. But that was only part of the gaming experience. In order to interact with menus or perform actions like aiming and shooting a gun, Nintendo decided to integrate an infrared camera in the system. But, unlike what you may think, the Wii's sensor bar only plays a supporting role in this feat. It provides a constant and stationary light source that can be read by an infrared camera integrated in the Wii Remote. You might remember from my Xbox Kinect video that infrared radiation comes from the part of the electromagnetic spectrum which contains wavelengths just longer than that of visible light. The sensor bar has two sets of five infrared light-emitting diodes, one on each end, that are relatively bright in the IR compared to normal household objects and are easily picked up by the Wii Remote. This lets the remote track and point without having the sensor bar shine bright visible lights in your face. In addition, a filter in front of the camera makes sure that only infrared light, or very red visible light, is seen by the camera. This cuts down on noise from other wavelengths. A fun thing to do, especially if you've got a teething kitten, is to use homemade infrared light sources to create a jury-rigged version of the sensor bar. Candles or incandescent light bulbs work especially well, even though they aren't quite as bright as the LEDs in the sensor bar and are more prone to interference, but it gets the job done. As an interesting side note, the addition of an honest-to-goodness, though cheap, infrared camera in the Wii Remote really got the hacking community excited back in 2006, much like the Xbox Kinect is doing today. One of the masters of the craft, Johnny Lee, a researcher that specializes in low-cost answers to high-tech devices, has written software that can turn this $40 device into things such as a digital whiteboard, a touchscreen, and even a head-mounted 3D viewer. He makes this software freely available and even presented these projects at the Technology Entertainment Design Conference in 2008, which is available on YouTube. You should certainly check it out if you want a more in-depth look at the functionality of the Wii Remote's camera, or just want to marvel at what nerds have wrought. So that's all for the Nintendo Wii Remote and Wii Motion Plus, the beginning of the motion gaming craze. Be sure to check out the next episode of The Way Games Work as we leave modern tech behind and go a little bit old school.
People from all walks of life are on their way to review Topia, Internet City of the Future. Our scientists have been working around the clock to bring in the absolute finest in handcrafted reviews, humor, and entertainment to please the eyes and ears of every man, woman, and child. Everything you need will be found right here in Reviewtopia. Operators are standing by to reserve your spot and keep you in touch with our team of reviewers. Blast off into the future of internet reviewing entertainment at Reviewtopia!